Hi, good afternoon. Hi, nice. All right. We're at the end of the day. Thank you guys very much for coming. I'm so happy to be here. It's my first time in Lisbon, and it's a gorgeous city, and it's a terrific event, so thank you, Bruno. Um, what I want to talk about today is this idea of Lean UX, and uh, I'm going to illustrate it right away with a couple of, of tactics that I put in play this year with a couple of teams that I've worked on, and then we'll get into the specifics of, of what Lean UX is and, and this, this idea of shared understanding, and so we'll talk a little bit about that, and then we'll, I'll, g I'll give you some very specific tactics, five specific tactics that you can take back to work when you go back to work on Monday if you like these ideas and implement them right away and see how they work for your teams. And then we'll dig into a little bit of specific situations where Lean UX works well and where it doesn't work well, and then we'll wrap up. Sound good? Okay, awesome. So uh, earlier this year, I was working with a startup in New York City, and this was a really interesting situation. It's a relatively small team, but all the UX and the product management resources were in New York, and all the development resources were in Vancouver, Canada. So that's about 3,000 miles away, and about three hours times difference. And there was no communication going on between these two teams that was outside of email or signed off documentation. So the UX and the product management teams in New York would design things and write them up and spec out everything and then ship it over to Vancouver and they'd look at it and they'd build something and they'd ship it back and the UX and product management teams would look at it and say, nah, that's not what we wanted and they'd volley back and forth like this over email and signed documentation. For years they did this. And so when I, when I started working with this team earlier this year, I said, here's what we're going to do with the next problem statement that we have to solve for our customers and for our business. We're going to design together. We're going to solve the problem together. And they said, how are we going to do this? The team's in Vancouver. We don't talk to them that much. We're in New York. And we did this over Skype. And this is an image of it. This is what it looked like. We set up two conference rooms with Skype. Everyone gets it. It's free. Everyone uses it. The teams in Vancouver got in one room. The team in New York got into another room. We looked at the problem statement, and we sketched ideas to solve the problem together. We facilitated a design studio, essentially, a collaborative design session across coasts in the United States over Skype. And we took photos, iPhone photos, of the sketches and emailed them around. So if you couldn't see, if you, initially we tried to hold up the sketches to the camera, but you couldn't see it that well. So we took photos with the iPhone and sent it around. And you could see what each other sketched. And the team started to talk and work together to solve this problem. And the energy and the enthusiasm and the collaboration between the teams increased exponentially. And the final product that came out of that project was far more successful and far more productive and efficient than anything those that team had created to date together. That was one, one case study. Uh, I used to be the director of UX at a company in New York called The Ladders, which was an online job board. And one of the challenges was that we didn't have any UX presence in the boardroom, in the, in the, in the, not even the boardroom, in the corporate strategic meetings. And we wanted to bring the voice of the customer to the strategic direction setting meetings for the company. And so one suggestion said, hey, why don't we do a persona? exercise. Why don't we pitch a persona research exercise to the company? We'll go out, we'll do the research, we'll come back and present our findings. Well, the problem with that is that it's expensive, it takes time, and the, the strategic meetings were happening very soon. We didn't have the time to do it. And so instead, what we did was we got all the executives together in a room for two, for two days, really two half days, four hours one day, four hours the other day, and we had them create ad hoc personas. So who do they think we're actually designing for? And each executive, CEO, CFO, CTO, VP of product, everybody's in the room, and they're, they're sketching together, and they're putting out on paper, visualizing who they think we're building products and services for. And over the course of two days, we got to a level of consensus where they understood that we had roughly six personas, at least they thought they had six personas that we were designing for. And this was at least a way for them to start focusing their conversations around a particular target audience, because what was happening in those conversations was the marketing, the VP of marketing would come in and have a very marketing-centered focus. And the customer service VP would come in and have a very call center focus. And the, technologies, the, the technologists in the room would have a very technology-centered focus. But nobody was representing the, the customer or the user in those meetings. And after, that, after we, we got to that consensus with the team, we knew that as, as uh, middle managers in the organization, we weren't actually going to be in all of those meetings on a regular basis. And so we made it easy for the team to take these personas that they had created and bring them into the meetings with them by creating these little playing cards for them. And so we took the, the, the outcomes of these, of these collaborative sessions where the teams built a shared understanding of who they believed they were building products for, not necessarily who we were building products for, but who they believed, at least to give them a direction, and they brought these into the meetings with them to help facilitate those discussions forward. So those are two case studies. 
that really start to focus around this idea of shared understanding. And these are slides from Jeff Patton, who's a terrific uh, Agile and UX practitioner. And this is how many projects start. Everybody says, all right, there's a problem. We all know how to solve it. I know how to solve it. You know how to solve it. But in their heads, everybody's got a different solution or a different way of approaching this. So the first thing you need to do is you need to start getting folks to articulate their visions. And visual articulation is very powerful. Put your ideas out there. Oh, wait a minute. You're thinking this, and I was thinking that, and she was thinking something else. And then as you're having conversations, and you're discussing these ideas, and you're bouncing them around back and forth, and you're iterating on these, you start to build consensus. And this is consensus that comes from developers, and from designers, and from customers and from executives. And what you're building in those conversations through the visual articulation and through these collaborative conversations is a shared understanding. And shared understanding is the currency of Lean UX. When you build a, a shared understanding with your teammates, with your stakeholders, with your customers, you can trade that for some of the UX documentation, or at least for the heft, the thickness, of the UX documentation that you're used to creating today. Because the teams understand more, they know where these ideas have come from, what triggered those decisions, and they don't need to be documented as heavily. And everybody can start working a bit more uh, from the same starting point together. And that's, that's what the goal of all of these activities are, is to build that shared understanding. And so I want to talk a second about what Lean UX is. And this is my definition of what Lean UX is. And it's one of the few slides I'll actually read to you. This is how I define it. So Lean UX is inspired by Lean Startup, and I'll get, through, I'll get to Lean Startup in just a second, for those of you not familiar, and Agile Development Theories, and it's the practice of bringing the true nature of design work to life faster in a collaborative, cross-functional way with less emphasis, not no emphasis, less emphasis on deliverables, and a greater focus on the actual experience being designed. And there's a reason why I underline true nature and actual experience, because the true nature of, of design work is the experience, it's the product, it's the service. None of us got into this business to, to write a document or to live in an Excel spreadsheet. We got into this business to build products, services, and experiences. So the faster that we can get there, the faster we can validate that we're actually building the right things and stop building and designing things that people don't want. How many of you work in an agile culture? That's significant, nice. So Agile is a, is a software development uh, methodology that was uh, written by developers for developers with no consideration for UX or design, ever. Let's be clear. However, when it's boiled down to the four points, the four main points in the Agile manifesto, and you start looking at these things, you start thinking about how can I apply this to user experience and design, there are a lot of things that can be applied. These are the four, the four uh, bullet points of the Agile manifesto, and we value the, 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 the preceding statement to this is we value the things on the left more than we value the things on the right. So we value individuals and interactions over processes and tools. We like to talk to people. We're going to talk to our teams. We're going to figure out how to best work together, regardless of whether it's Agile or Waterfall or Agile Fall or whatever you want to call it. Working software over comprehensive documentation. Show me how it works. Don't tell me how it works. Let's build something. Let's execute it. Let's see if it works. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Hey, if we built the wrong thing, let's get a sense of it from our customers and not worry about the details. Let's figure out very quickly that we built the wrong thing, iterate, and start building the right thing much faster. And then finally, responding to change over following a plan. So as you're moving forward, as you're building your product, as you're learning through this customer collaboration, through these interactions, don't keep your head in the sand and think, oh, I have to get to point uh, X down there. If there's a change, it's okay to adjust course, because you've learned something new and something has changed. These are agile philosophies, but they apply to design, and I'll show you how. I want to talk about Lean for a second, where this Lean UX title came from. So Lean started in the 1950s uh, in Toyota's manufacturing process in Japan. In the 1980s, uh, a couple named Tom and Mary Poppendike brought it to software development. And uh, they're legends in the agile world. If you haven't heard of them, you should absolutely read their stuff. And then recently, a gentleman named Eric Reese wrote a book called The Lean Startup where he took these ideas and he applied lean thinking and lean thinking in software to the idea of building a business. And he created this, this build, measure, learn loop. And his thinking, his, his philosophy is build something very quickly, measure whether or not you've built the right thing, learn from that, and then iterate. But cut down the time of that loop as, to as short a time as possible so the feedback loop is super tight and that you're getting these validated learnings as quickly as possible. So you're heading down a more accurate path with each iteration. 
And what's really interesting is this is, this is the core principle of the, lean, of the Lean Startup philosophy where he says it's, it has a premise that every startup is a grand experiment. And you can, you can change the word startup there for product, service, design, feature, business, anything you, anything you want. It's a grand experiment. And you're not trying to answer whether or not this thing can be built. We can build pretty much anything at this point. The question that you're trying to answer is should we build this? And if we build it, will we actually make money, build a business, solve a, solve a customer need? And here's the interesting part. The way that you experiment with your ideas about should we build this is not some theoretical ivory tower scientific experiment. It's an actual product. So let's get to a product as quickly as possible with as little effort as possible, with as little waste, and then make sure that it's the right one. And if it's not, let's, let's iterate and move this thing forward. And so you take these two ideas, Agile and Lean Startup, and they're philosophies. They're not necessarily methodologies. And so you translate them into a design process, and it looks something like this. And I drew these myself, which I'm very proud of. So here, here's the process itself. You're a designer. You've been presented with a problem to solve, a problem statement, something that's, that, that you need to design a solution for. The first thing that you do is you have an idea. OK, I think I'm going to solve it this way. What you do is you create the minimum amount of fidelity of the artifact that you need to create to convey that idea to the next person that you need to, to, to communicate that idea to. So create a sketch that it could look just like that. If that conveys your idea, that's enough. A conversation is enough. A wireframe is good enough. A Photoshop document is good enough if that's what you need to convey your idea. But do it quickly. Don't spend a lot of time. Get the idea down and then start validating your ideas internally. Grab your stakeholders, grab your product manager, grab developers. Hey, I'm thinking about going down this path. What do you guys think? Is this the right approach? Is this not the right approach? Why is it the wrong approach? Let me figure that out. And then go back and iterate on that concept at that fidelity level until you start building some level of consensus with your internal teams, with your stakeholders, with your executives, and so forth. And so you're doing this very, very quickly. As soon as you have some level of consensus, get a prototype built. Again, whatever level of fidelity you can prototype, you choose to prototype, or you need to prototype. So paper's fine if you can get the feedback that you need. Axure works, fireworks, code, whatever you need to do. Clickable PowerPoints will work if it gets your point across. And then get that in front of customers very, very quickly on a regular basis. Learn from their behavior and then iterate on this process over and over and over. And this is not a, a three-month process. This is not a six-month process. This could be a day. You could do this in a day. You could do this in a week, a couple of days, as quickly as you can get through this process as many times as possible so that you keep adjusting your course to building the right thing, that you're designing the right thing. And if you don't work in an agile environment and you do have a design phase a, you know, in the traditional waterfall uh, cycle, this could be just your UX process, and that's OK. Instead, instead of disappearing for a week or a month behind your monitor when, you've been, when, when the design phase has kicked off, sketch something, and then go grab a developer and say, hey, I think, I think I'm going to design it this way. What do you think? Let's get some feedback on that. And bring them into the design process. Start building that shared understanding. Start building that collaboration, because what you'll find is when you get to a point where it's ready to actually go to code, the people that you've been talking to this whole time, they know what you're building. They know what you're designing. And the documentation that you need to create decreases significantly. It's more shared understanding, less documentation. I'm a child of the 80s. And I don't know if you guys know this movie. This is a movie called Better Off Dead. It was a big hit in the US in the 1980s. Uh, who knows this movie? Well, very few hands. OK, so I've got to explain the scene to you. OK, so this is. Uh, the, the, it's, it's classic, you know, boy tries to get the girl, he's got a quirky friend, his quirky friend is telling him how to get the girl, and it's a skiing movie, it's about skiing. And so there's th these two gentlemen are standing on top of a mountain, it's a big mountain, the hill is huge, and this guy doesn't really know how to ski very well. And, uh, and he says, I I teach me how to ski, I don't know what to do, I have to get down there. And, and, and his quirky friend says to him, go that way, go down the hill, really fast. If something gets in your way, turn. That's it, that's, that's what he tells him. And if you think about it, this is exactly what I'm talking about. You're the designer. You're standing on top of that mountain. It's not a big mountain. And you're looking down. And you're saying, I have to get there. I have to solve the problem. It's, and, and I think the solution is down there at the bottom. So I'm going to go that way really fast. And as things get in my way, I'm going to adjust my course. Eventually, you're going to get to the bottom of the hill. And you're going to solve that problem. It may not be the path that you actually thought you were going to take to get there. 
but you got there as quickly as possible. As things got in your way, you turned. So 80s movies are a really good source of inspiration uh, <laughs> for this. If you think about, think about it this way, okay, the traditional UX processes, the deliverables, the sign-offs, the, the, the iterations are a bottleneck in fast-paced environments with so much innovation and so much disruption happening in the marketplace today, waiting to start building something until a design has been signed off by the 10 different people who need to sign it off so no one gets fired in case it fails, is too late. We're getting in our own way. And the products and the services and the context in which we have to design are getting so much more complex and so much more challenging that the design documentation itself, the paper itself, can't convey these experiences. So even if you did wait to, to, to spec out every screen and flipboard, could you possibly have described the experience of using Flipboard? I don't think so. And so what this boils down to specifically is that this is a fundamental rethinking of the way we do our work. It's, it's a shift in saying, instead of working on our own and solving the problem and then coming in and saying, here it is, it's shiny, it's beautiful, please go build this, and then of course 50% of that gets built and then the rest doesn't, right? It's about saying, hold on, if I, if I include people in my design process, if I bring the team in, if I bring the customer in, I will know sooner if I'm building the right thing, if I'm designing the right thing. How can we get that validated learning faster? How do we work together faster? And then let's bring people into the design process. And here's the catch, and this is, this is key, this is a critical thing. This is a designer-led initiative. Okay? You're going to go back to work on Monday, no one's going to come asking you for a sketch. No one's going to come asking you to show them the next thing that you jot down. You have to get out from behind your monitor and show them this work and help them understand where you're headed and start to build that shared understanding and do whatever it takes to get your work out there in public. Put it out there, post it, walk around, get up out of your desk and show this work to people. The responsibility is yours and ours. So my assumption at this point is that you're a little bit intrigued and you'd like to know how this works in, 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 in actual practical terms which is why I come to conferences. So I'll give you five, five specific tactics about how Lean UX works, how to make it work in your organization, and you can take these things and do them on Monday. And if it works for you, email me and let me know, because I'd love to hear about it. If it fails for you, email me. I'd love to hear about it. The first tactic of Lean UX is solve your problems together. Teams are far more motivated to build solutions they came up with than to build a solution that you hand to them. Give a cross-functional team a problem to solve. Let them solve it, let them come up with their solution, and then let them build it. It'll be, they'll be far more productive, far more efficient, and far more enthusiastic to actually build that. Plus, it starts to build, it starts, they start to understand each other. They start to know where everybody's coming from, and they build that shared understanding. I'm going to say that phrase a lot if I haven't already. That's the first tactic of Lean UX. The second tactic of Lean UX is sketching, and it's all the rage these days. I hear somebody wrote a book about it, too. I don't know. Uh, but um, it's about sketching. Get your teams to visualize their thinking. Remember that, that square, circle, triangle diagram at the beginning? Get them to put those squares and circles and triangles out in the wild and let them see each other's work. Let them articulate. And uh, if people tell you that they can't sketch or they can't draw, you have to reveal to them the, the ultimate secret of interaction design. You guys know the ultimate secret of interaction design? If you can draw a circle, a square, and a triangle, you can sketch any interface. Okay, don't tell them, because we'll all lose our jobs, right? <laughs> but, but, that, but that levels the playing field. Everybody can draw those three shapes, so they can participate in the process. People say, I can't draw. They can participate in the process. Let me show you an example, very quickly, of, of something that I did. I spent two hours at a whiteboard with a developer one morning, sketching this this uh, interface. I sketched, he sketched, I erased, he erased, we talked, we worked together, we talked about what data would go into these things, what, what elements, how this thing would behave. And at the end of two hours, we walked away from this and we started building. He started writing code and I started refining the design from this to wireframe to visual design. We started from the same point in time and we worked together in a parallel path and we sat next to each other and we compared notes along the way. And the only way that we were able to do this is because we had a shared understanding. We built it by spending two hours together figuring this UI out together, and saying this is what we think will solve the problem. And within two weeks, we ended up here. So we went from, from this sketch, which you can see has a headshot and a message uh, box and three columns and a header and a footer, 
to this, which has a headshot and a message box and three columns and a header and a footer. He had enough of, a, of an idea of what data needed to come up here, roughly the layout of the page, which bought me the time that I needed to refine the sketch from the whiteboard to this. And we built this in two weeks. So we could test it. We got to an experience, not a document, in two weeks so that we could test this and see if this was the right approach. And then we learned from this and we iterated from this. The third tactic of Lean UX is prototyping. And this is it's, it's the key. Get, build an experience, don't write a document. This is the famous wooden block from Jeff Hawking from Palm, uh, when he invented the Palm Pilot to see if people would actually walk around with something in their pocket. We all do it today, but back then it wasn't common. He, had, he took a wooden block and he kept it in his pocket and he walked around with it. And then he occasionally would write, pretend to write things on it to see if that made sense. And instead of throwing money at R&D and, and technology and, and all kinds of industrial design, he had a wooden block in his pocket just to prove the idea at first. It was, it was Lean UX way back in the day, right, to figure it out and then move that forward. And then what's interesting is that once you've got a prototype of any fidelity, you can then show it to your team. It's validated. You have a sense that it's the right idea. Customers have seen it. Show it to your team. And from that point, the team can get started building. Okay? No additional deliverables are needed for them to start working. There may be more deliverables needed further down the line, but to get everybody started at that pace, if they need to know what happens when they click a button, you click the button in the prototype. If they need to know what happens on the next page, you go to the next page, you swipe through. But everybody can at least get started and working and continue that conversation. The fourth tactic of Lean UX is pairing up. That's it? Come on, it's funny. I think it's funny. Uh, uh, Samuel Bowles gave a great talk yesterday, I hope, hope some of you guys caught it, about uh, designer pairing, pairing designers together, and the benefits that come out of that. What I want to talk about today is, uh, is pairing designers and developers together. Now, the way we did this when I was at the Ladders was to put together a, uh, a designer and developer, and they sat next to each other, and they worked in Firebug. You guys know Firebug? It's, uh, it's, a, it's a plugin for, uh, for Firefox that allows you to manipulate the JavaScript, the HTML, the CSS in real time. Every browser can do this. And what they would do is they would sit together and they'd manipulate the design in real time. And at the end of that process, whether it took an hour or two hours, they had code, working code. Not a document that described an experience, not a picture that would then become a document that would then become an experience. They had code. It's tremendously efficient. Now, there's a couple other benefits that come from this. The first is that because they're sitting next to each other, they start to see how each other work. And they start to understand the needs of each other. So the developer sees, oh wow, a lot of these, these difficult things go into every design decision. You guys work really hard. The designer sees, oh wow, it's really hard to, to do rounded corners and gradients and drop shadows and these types of things. Okay, I understand that. I'm going to build that into, into my understanding of how we work together. And that transparency starts to build trust and they start to work better together. And there's one more benefit that comes from that. Your designers when your developers are empowered to start working on design, it sets resource-constrained designers free to work on something else. So if, you're t and, and if, you're, if you work in a resource-constrained situation, and uh, I don't know how many of you don't work in one of those, um, you can empower your developers to go build designs because they've worked with you and they understand the pieces that go into some of these ideas, and that can free you up to work on something else or something more challenging, simply something different. And so that empowerment comes from that pairing, that cross-functional pairing. The fifth tactic of Lean UX is style guides. And this powers the whole thing. So if it's made of pixels, put it in a style guide. Make it live, make it editable, make it actionable. Put someone in charge of it. Someone should own it. It should have an owner, a name. Somebody you can say and go, how do I get this into the style guide? How does it work? But if, it made, if it's made out of pixels, all your patterns go into this, design patterns, uh, component patterns, anything that goes into this so that what you build essentially is an asset library with code of all the pieces of your UI. And this facilitates the prototyping process because you can just go grab a header, a footer, a grid, a carousel and put ideas together very, very quickly and click through those experiences. If it's made of pixels, it goes in the style guide. Jason Fried runs a company in uh, Chicago called 37 Signals. They make Basecamp and High Rise and other kinds of products. And the, uh, he, he says this, and this is the mantra that I, I kind of dropped on my team. He says, speed first, aesthetic second. Work quickly and then make it beautiful after that. Get something out there. And I actually, I, I, I dropped this on my team at the ladders when I was working there. And this is what they came back to me and said this. 
They said, when I work this way, I feel like I'm going for the bronze. This was a lot of pushback. I'm running for third place. I'm never putting out my best work. And I would argue that this is true if you don't iterate. Right? So Stu Eccles, my friend over in London, says it's not iterative if you only do it once. The idea is to do this quickly and iterate and iterate and iterate so that you're starting at bronze. You are starting at bronze level work because you're never going to get it right the first time. Start at bronze and then iterate quickly through that validated learning loop to get to gold medal work as quickly as you can. And this is, this is the key for all of this. Okay? I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how many years you've been designing. I don't care if you have an industrial design degree. I don't, I don't, don't care. Unless you're building a product for yourself, every design that you put out there is a hypothesis. It's a guess. It's an educated guess, but it's a guess. And so your job is then to validate or invalidate that hypothesis as quickly as possible so you're not designing something that somebody doesn't want because that's waste and we want to get that out of the way. Every design is a hypothesis. And you start to validate that with customer insight every week. It should not be some event in the future. Hey, in six months, we're going to see 24 customers for three days, and we're going to get some feedback. Have your customers in every week. We tested every Thursday, three people. Three people every Thursday. It was a regular conversation that we had with our customers. And we always showed them whatever we had ready. And that provided us a steady stream of qualitative insight into the designs that we were working on at the time. Supplement that qualitative insight with quantitative insight. Put your designs and your ideas into split testing platforms, A-B testing platforms, and bring in the quantitative data. And make this an ongoing thing so you always have access to data to support the decisions and decide why the red button is better than the blue button, or why should you put it up here or down here. And ultimately, form factor doesn't matter at all. I hear a lot of complaints, well, we can't do it on mobile, or it's really hard, we're working on hardware. Uh, it doesn't matter. Let me show you something. This is, uh, you guys know meetup.com? You know that site? They're in New York. Uh, this is their mobile testing rig. It cost them $28 to build. It's made up of a stand, a lamp, a webcam, and that black thing in the middle, it's a paint stir. It's a paint stick you buy at the hardware store to stir the paint. Okay, it's a piece of wood. 28 bucks. Instead of waiting around and trying to get approval for a mobile testing rig or figuring out what to do, they went out, they built this thing, and they started getting feedback. It may not be the best feedback, but it's better than nothing. Don't wait for it. Informal and quick is better than nothing. And then at the end, if you, once you've made your decisions and you've validated your learnings and you're building something that somebody actually wants, and then you need to document, go ahead and document. My friend, Len, my friend Lane Halley likes to say, lead with conversation and trail with documentation. Write the document at the end when you've made all your decisions and you don't need to rewrite it again. If, if your company needs it, if somebody, deserves, if somebody demands it, that's fine. Do it when you're done. Because the goal, again, is to get everybody started and going together at the same time, working together in a parallel path. Get your teams working together on the same problems. And so by waiting for a document, you're staggering that. You're saying, I have to write this document and get it approved, and then you can start, and then we can kind of leapfrog this thing and move it forward. Get everybody working together. Two quick notes of what Lean UX is not, OK? Two, two really quick things. The first thing is, uh, click. Lean UX is not lazy, OK? Sorry. It's not less work. In fact, it's probably more work. Okay? You're going to have to get out there and talk to folks specifically. And I love this quote. Austin Govella, who lives in Texas in the United States, said this about Lean UX. He said, the best part is that the team is doing a whole lot of UX. Right? They document a ton of stuff explicitly on the walls. So that's the, that's the whiteboards and the sketches. And implicitly in shared understanding among team members. So this is active. You're actively going out there, and you're working harder, and you're talking to folks. You're taking the arsenal of UX tools, and you're just deploying it at the right depth at the right time. You're not using everything all at once, all the time. The second thing Lean UX is not is designed by committee. And this is critical. You're going to collect all this insight from customers, from product managers, from developers, and you're going to bring all that insight. You're going to synthesize it, and you're going to iterate on your design. And when you come out and you show the next iteration of the design to your team, you have to tell them why you made those decisions. Well, I chose this feedback because it was validated by customers. And I, chose, and I discarded this feedback because we saw this didn't test well. And whatever it is, but you have to have that communication back out so people feel like they're part of the process and that you're not ignoring their feedback. You have to communicate that back out to them. And so a couple thoughts about where Lean UX works well and where uh, it'll struggle. So if you're an in-house designer, if you're an in-house designer uh, at a company, and you don't feel like you can move your organization as a whole, start small, start internal, 
grab a developer, show them a sketch, start working together, and ask for forgiveness later. What happens is people start to be jealous of the way you're working, and they're looking in, they're saying, I want to work that way too. I've seen this happen in organizations specifically when, when the team start to collaborate. People want into that energy. There's a vibe and a creativity and efficiency in that team that reinvigorates the organization. Because what you're ultimately doing is you're solving business problems, and you're not writing documentation. You're solving business problems with software. If you work in a startup, this is the only way to work. Lean UX is the only way to work in a startup. Collaborate together, work quickly, talk to your teams, and iterate because you're going to run out of money. And then you'll have nothing to build, and you'll be broke. If you work in the agency world, it's a little bit of a tougher sell, and it's, it's because primarily the agency's business model, and this is, this is the key thing about agencies. Agencies are in the deliverables business. Agencies sell, the majority of them sell output, not outcomes. They sell documentation specifically. And so th there's a fundamental shift in the business model of an agency to make this actually work. So this was the in-house Lean UX model. And if you look at it a bit from the, uh, And if you rework it for an agency, what you're doing is you're involving the client. Hey, client, you're going to set those expectations. We're going to meet two, three times a week for 15 minutes. We're going to show you what we did yesterday, and we're going to involve you in the process. We're going to make you a part of the team. And they begin to own the process, and they begin to iterate and grow with you. And so if you're working with distributed teams, specifically if they're a part of your organization, this can, abs this can absolutely work if you think back to the first case study. You just have to get on the same page and start seeing each other. Some companies put permanent video conference walls between the offices, so you can kind of have a window into San Francisco from New York, that type of thing. If you're working with a third-party vendor, they're going to need to know what to build and how, to, how, how they're getting paid. So Lean UX breaks down there. And so is this good for every project? Specifically, if it's a task-based project, so you have to purchase something. There's a beginning, there's an end. Lean UX works really, really well. If you're building more experiential marketing sites, it struggles a bit because there's no specific out outcome that you can measure, except maybe for serial sales, if you're building a serial site. But how do you attribute it to the site? It becomes a bit tougher. With content-heavy experiences, you just need to know what the building blocks are. I'm going to get an RSS feed from TechCrunch. I'm going to get a video feed from YouTube. And I'm going to put these, you can start blocking out the experience. So Lean UX works very well there. And so I'll wrap up with this. Designers are used to being heroes. We like to come in and be given a very difficult problem, solve it, make something beautiful, hand it off. Everybody goes, ooh, and ah. My favorite new phrase in this is ta-da design, right? Ta-da. Right? Lean UX is distinctly anti-hero. It's a collaborative, team-based process that allows everybody into the design process. And here's the kicker. When you let people into the design process, they start to see what design thinking means, and it creates empathy in these three different spaces. It creates empathy for the customer, where perhaps there was none before. Maybe your developers never thought about the customer. Maybe the marketing people never thought about the customer. Right? They start to understand it. It creates empathy for the problem space. Why are we building this? Right? I I've talked to so many developers in so many organizations who have no idea why they're actually building a feature. There's empathy for that. And it creates empathy for the design discipline. People see that it's hard to be a designer and all the decisions that go into, into everything that we do. And Lean UX brings that to a broader audience. And look, ultimately this is an evolution, not a revolution. The markets are changing, companies are changing, the demands on UX design as a profession are changing. We need to evolve with it, and Lean UX is the next step. Thank you guys very much.